welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. This is Dr. Greer, and I'd like to thank the people at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks. And um, we're going to be talking about some very interesting top-secret government documents today. And I'm joined uh, today with uh, Linda Willits, who has worked with us for about uh, 12 years on these projects. And uh, we're going to be very... uh, focused on some of the content of the briefing materials that have been provided to uh, President Obama and the top administration officials uh, over the past year. Uh, We're wanting to focus on this because many people uh, have asked uh, what are some of the things that are in uh, this uh, briefing. Now, I'd like to explain that uh, about uh, three or four months ago in October of uh, 2009, we released the uh, contents of the cover letter from uh, the Disclosure Project and, and uh, that I wrote for President Obama and the Obama administration that went to, to them shortly after the uh, inauguration. And we released it because we felt that after about nine months it was time that the public should be able to see the content of that. That is at uh, disclosureproject.org and also csetti.org. Um, and there should be a link uh, if you go to disclosureproject.org and see this uh, uh, overview of the subject, uh, which I wrote, which many people have felt is one of the best summaries uh, that exists for the subject. So uh, that is up on our website. What is also now up on our website are a few, just a sampling of some of the uh, dozens of top secret documents uh, that we have provided to the Obama administration, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to go through so that people have a sense of uh, of, of the content of this, this briefing uh, is that material uh, today, and I think we, the, the reason for this is that so many people uh, who are interested in what we're doing with contact have also asked, you know, what are the foundation for the assessments that we've made, that number one, we're not alone in the universe, and number two, that it's been kept secret for many uh, decades from the American public and the world. And also, number three, uh, you know, what is the proof of this? So we want to go through some of this today. It's all been put together over the last 20 years by uh, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Disclosure Project. And you can go to cseti.org and disclosureproject.org to see much of this. But we're just going to review some of this. Of course, we can't go through all the thousands of of things that exist, I point out to folks. Uh, I was interviewed recently, and someone said, "Well, you know, what in particular?" I said, "Well, it's the weight of the evidence. I mean, there's some something on the order of 4,000 uh, cases where these ET spacecraft have landed and left physical evidence, uh, and we have these sort of cases in the briefing materials we gave the president. For example, the French government <laughs> released and provided to us the account of the landing of an ET spacecraft in Provence." Uh, France uh, back a few years back, uh, I think it was in the 80s, where it actually landed in a lavender field. And these uh, uh, ETs were seen by a farmer outside the craft gathering samples of lavender in this field and obviously doing some kind of biological sampling. And uh, it left a physical trace where the place where the ET spacecraft sat down uh, indented the sto- soil and left uh, uh, changes of energetic changes in the soil and the plants, which were very well documented and studied actually by their space institute, uh, their equivalent of NASA in France is, is Japan. So these are the sort of cases that are in this briefing. So when people say, well, you know, is there any physical evidence and proof? We say, yes, there's an enormous amount of it. There are 4,000 of these sort of cases, like the one in Provence. I also point out that there are over uh, 3,500 pilot cases, and uh, some of the best of these are ones that we have uh, gotten through the Disclosure Project, Um, and if you go to disclosureproject.org and and get the book Disclosure uh, and the videos that go with it where we have these top secret uh, government officials speaking, uh, you'll see some of these documents and their testimony. And, And one really good example is is a man named John Callahan who approached me after he had heard me uh, uh, publicly at some point back in the 90s, and he says, "You know, everyone's always asking who are the top, who are the high government officials who know of this 
information and have seen this information and who have uh, seen how it's been kept secret, and I am one of those people. And he volunteered to come forward, and he became part of the Disclosure Project uh, uh, effort. And uh, he was the man at the FAA. He was the third highest ranking official at the FAA during the Reagan years. And uh, he was the one who investigated this uh, case where a massive ET spacecraft the size of uh, a battleship uh, was uh, uh, tracking alongside a uh, Japan Airlines 747 over Alaska. Uh, I believe it was 1986, and he said that uh, this was not only on the radar of the civilian radar, but it was also on military radar and the military scrambled jets. Uh, the pilot of the 747 Japan Airlines cargo uh, craft uh, said that they not only could see it visually, but had it on their onboard radar and that it interacted with them and signaled, and that in addition to that, they were able to uh, uh, determine that the uh, uh, this this enormous spacecraft would move uh, from one area of the sky, and in one radar scope sweep, would then reappear, you know, sort of dematerialize and rematerialize uh, uh, many many miles away in another part of the sky, uh, within one sweep of the radar scope. We have not only the testimony of the pilot of the 747 and also this senior official at the FAA. But we also have the top secret government documents that he was able to acquire, including the original, I want to emphasize this, original radar tracking and the digital readout and report of this, um, uh, proving that this was a solid object that materialized and was moving in this way. Uh, we also have the report uh, from the FAA and also of the pilot and his statement. Uh, and uh, now I want to emphasize that this is one of the most important cases that has ever been released and the most documented. And uh, the, the back story of this is when uh, there was an investigation. Uh, John Callahan was head of the Accidents and Investigations section of the FAA at the time, uh, and this was handed off to him on an urgent basis when the event occurred. And he reviewed it. And at some point, he got called in to uh, do a briefing. And Reagan's uh, science advisor people were there, and there were three people from the FBI and the CIA. And there was an admiral at the time who was head of the FAA. Um, and all this information, by the way, is in disclosureproject.org, uh, the books and the videos. Now, interestingly, the meeting proceeded uh, as a, a briefing that John Callahan was, was sort of uh, perform was uh, conducting for all these senior officials from the CIA and, and uh, the White House and what have you. And at the end of it, the CIA uh, guy said basically, well, we want all of the original materials. We're going to take everything in this room because there were boxes and boxes full of digital readouts, uh, radar tapes, reports, analysis, everything. A uh, huge volume of, of data and documentation. And they said, this is one of the best reports uh, that we have ever had of one of these objects. Uh, and uh, we're going to take all this, but we're going to take everything so that nothing will be left here at the FAA. And uh, they also proceeded to tell him that this meeting never happened, this event didn't happen, and nothing is to be said to the public. Well, John Callahan was astonished because he said, well, here's prima facie evidence of us being visited by uh, very advanced technological civilizations, and he was witness to the cover-up. He was witness to how the secrecy was slammed down on this thing. Interestingly, and this is the thing that most people don't realize when they read this story, is that all the material that John Callahan had at the admiral's, uh, who was head of the FAA, briefing room, and that was taken by the intelligence community were actually copies and not the originals. When he retired from the FAA, he took the originals with him and then provided them to us, the Disclosure Project. So we have them. Now, interestingly, uh, he, he said that this is sort of an outrage that something like this would be kept secret. And so this is one example. So when people ask, what evidence and proof do you have? I said, well, we have... 4,000 landing cases with the documentations from the 
official government research scientists like the Provence case in France. We have 3,500 pilot and radar cases like the one I just described to you. We have, of course, a huge number of astonishing videos and photographs of these objects. And we have the top secret witness testimony of 110 of these sort of uh, government and corporate officials like John Callahan from the FAA that are all in our possession. Now, obviously, those are thousands of pages of transcripts and thousands of pages of government documents and thousands of pages of report incidents, and no one's going to read a book that large. So what we did, just so people have an idea, in the last 10 years, we put all this together into the Disclosure Project book and into the videos. And you can go on DisclosureProject.org and get the two-hour and also a four-hour video of these top secret witnesses speaking. And also on the two-hour video uh, called Disclosure that have these, these top secret witnesses speaking, there was also a nearly 500-page briefing document that was a lot of the material that was provided to President Clinton's CIA director and to President Clinton and other senior officials back during that period in the 90s. And uh, in that are also some very important top secret documents, including some of these that I'm going to share today uh, with, with folks, uh, and that we've also included in the briefing materials for President Obama and his administration, his senior officials. So I wanted to give this background to people so they have sort of a sense of the scope of the information and the uh, uh, gravitas of it, but also the credibility of it. We're not dealing with secondhand accounts. We're not dealing with secondhand uh, reportage. And it's what's interesting is the hypocrisy in the mainstream media. And, you know, if you have uh, three independent people who will confirm a sexual affair with the president of the United States, you can have him impeached, uh, and it will be front page news in the papers for uh, two or three years. Uh, here we have 110 first-hand, top-secret whistleblowers from inside the government, thousands of government pages, and the kind of dispositive proof that I'm talking about in terms of radar tapes and images and landing physical evidence, physical uh, proof. And you cannot get a story on this done credibly in the New York Times or Washington Post. So you have to ask yourself, who really controls the big media? And this is why the Internet and shows like the World Pusion Network are so important to freedom and democracy is that there be an avenue for people to hear the truth and, and learn this information without the filter of these large corporate lackeys of the national security state keeping all of it secret. So that's our purpose, and that's why you know we exist. One of the reasons uh, we exist because people need to understand that this is not just based on, uh, you know, uh, little ladies in tennis shoes seeing a light in the sky. Uh, you know, the way this is often portrayed in the media is that, you know, they'll interview someone, you know, who lives in a trailer park who has half his teeth missing and can't articulate a grammatically correct sentence. And they'll say, you know, well, this person, and they'll just dis try to discredit the subject that way. And it's all stagecraft. It's all, it's all gamesmanship. Uh, it has nothing to do with the truth. And in reality, you have, you know, astronomers and you have Ph.D. scientists and you have senior government officials and you have, you know, highly uh, qualified technical people and pilots and people like this who are all providing this positive proof and evidence and testimony and documents that if it was on any other subject, it would be the end of it. It would be there would be no further discussion of a question about whether it exists. So I just want to point that out to folks because many times people will ask the question, you know, how do we know this exists and what is the evidence for it? And uh, so we're wanting to just do a little bit of a review of that today. Now, one of the things that I think is very important to understand is some of the documents that we have acquired are documents that are top secret but have not been declassified. And um, many people have felt this to be quite astonishing uh, and have asked me, well, how is that legal? Um, I want to give you a little bit of the background that over the last you know, 10 to 15 years of, of how we came to be able to operate in this fashion. Uh, it's very important to understand that 
Our assessment after I briefed the CIA director and after I briefed members of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee and members of the House uh, Government Oversight Committee and people like this, um, people who normally would be read into or briefed on top secret operations in, you know, cham- in, a, in, a, in, a, in an electronically sealed chamber, um, these were all people who were being left out of the loop and lied to about this subject. Um, I also met with and personally briefed face-to-face the uh, director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the largest uh, intelligence gathering operation for the Pentagon. It is like a CIA within the Pentagon um, with some you know, 10,000 people who work there. Um, I also have briefed the CIA director directly. I've also briefed the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, who J2, which is the person who's in charge of intelligence analysis and uh, assessments for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. Uh, I've also met with the former Minister of Defense head, Lord Hill Norton, who was a five-star admiral and had been head of the Ministry of Defense, but also head of the military committee for NATO. And every single one of these senior officials um, had been denied access to this information. And I think this is what's very important. Once between 1993 or 92, and 1998, when we worked through this system and concluded that there was an extra-constitutional, rogue, illegal, secret government within the government, a sort of a transnational entity that was keeping this secret, much as what Senator Inouye described during the Iran-Contra hearings when he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that there exists a secret government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own funding mechanism, etc. And by the way, this quote is on our website and also in the book and on the videos, uh, the actual footage of Senator Inouye saying this. What I think that people have to understand is that this group, it's called Majestic uh, for short, uh, that was formed during the Truman era, escaped the control of the President of the United States during the Eisenhower period and has remained independent and functioned as a governing entity unto itself and has therefore broken all the laws of the United States and is itself rogue and illegal. Therefore, a priori and forever, we declared that group rogue and any documents, testimony, material, information, intelligence, about this subject, we declared to be public domain with no national security classification around it. Now, the reason for that, and this is a very important that people listen carefully to what I'm about to say, is that let's say that you're running a criminal and you're, you're a member of the mafia and you're running a criminal enterprise. If you're running a criminal enterprise and you enter into uh, a contract or an agreement with someone, that contract and agreement is unenforceable because the enterprise itself is illegal. It vitiates and completely negates that agreement. In the same way, these t- programs that are illegally run, that have lied to presidents and have lied to members of the Congress and have even lied to senior military and intelligence officials that I have briefed, they cannot then claim protection under the National Security Act. Now, they have a lot of people hoodwinked who work for them who don't know this because the lower level, or should I say mid-level and lower level functionaries within these top secret programs think that they're being properly managed and run. But we can prove otherwise. And once we were able to do that by 1997 and 1998, we declared in an open letter to the government, which is in our book, the first book I wrote, Extraterrestrial Contact, The Evidence and Implications, which is also at disclosureproject.org for anyone to read. We declared in a letter that went to all the heads of, of the various agencies of the government that these projects were illegal, and therefore we were liberating all the witnesses, all the top secret sources, the whistleblowers, and the documents. And I put out a call for people to come forward, and boy, did they. We have now over 500 
of these sort of top secret people who have given me information on how these operations are, are going forward and what they're doing. I have distilled that information into this briefing for the President of the United States and also for the public to see. And there are, as a result, some top secret documents that were given to me from insiders that are unquestionably authentic, that have not been declassified. But we have considered them public domain because they are being uh, kept secret by a group that routinely lies to the constitutionally and legally required oversight officials, meaning the president, the secretary of defense, the members of the cabinet, and the senior committee members of the Congress. And therefore, uh, they have basically rendered themselves unprotected. And we, as an act of uh, true uh, legal uh, civil responsibility, have, have decided these documents can be known. For this reason, we have now placed on our website some of these documents. And one of the ones I want to to refer to, which is uh, one of the first ones that you will see when you get on uh, our website, uh, and that is certainly one of the first documents that President Obama saw. And also, I have to say this briefing went to uh, the new CIA dir director of the CIA, Leon Panetta, and the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and Secretary of Defense uh, Gates, and a few other folks. And uh, from 1991, 28 July 1991, at 0900 hours, we have here uh, a document from the NRO, that's the National Reconnaissance Office. Now, most Americans have never heard of this group. It's a very top-secret operation that runs uh, satellites and reconnaissance systems. Uh, and uh, it was from their NRO Central Security Service, and uh, it was a classified, restricted document, and the subject was a special security advisory slash blue fire was the code name. And what is very important in this document, basically the reason it was written is that there was a group of people who were trying to penetrate the, uh, the perimeter of the so-called Area 51 and see what it was that we were flying and, and doing out there. And uh, this document uh, uh, was basically a security alert because of this, this uh, attempt to penetrate uh, late at night the perimeter of that base by a group of people who were trying to find out what in the heck was going on out near uh, in Nellis Air Force Base, uh, Area 51, uh, which is better known as S-4, S-12, S-9, Pahoot Mesa. Now, I want to go through this document, and if you're on our website and you're looking at it, uh, the really important part of this document is the uh, distribution list. And uh, if you look at it, uh, the distribution list includes uh, names such as Royal Ops, Cosmic Ops. Now, we've heard for years there's a cosmic top secret clearance compartmentalized that deals with the ET issue. Here it is in black and white, Cosmic Ops. Madge Ops for Majestic and also Magi Ops. Both are related to the Majestic, but they're different compartments. And then there's a whole bunch of others. Um, and then a AFOSI, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, Nellis Division, and it actually gives the numbered uh, squadrons, 26th, 64th, 65th, 527th, 5021, Aggressor Squadron Commanders. And these are the people, the security people. And then a whole lot of other compartmented commander and code numbers that are listed. And then what's very important are all the MOC, the Military Operating Centers. Uh, and these are specific compartmented facilities and operations uh, that are related to the ET uh, issue and also the use of so-called alien reproduction vehicles or UFOs that are man-made that fly in and out of Edwards and Edwards uh, Air Force Base and Nellis and also uh, the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah and uh, the facility in Australia, Pine Gap, and a few other places. But take a note of this. 
Red Flag MOC, MOC Military Operating Center, Dart East MOC, Dart South, Pahoot Mesa. Now, we've heard from people who've worked at Pahoot Mesa what they have there, including uh, ET spacecraft that have been studied and reverse engineered, but also operational man-made devices that are anti-gravity and what have you. Sally Corridor, Groom Lake MOC, Dreamland MOC. Now, this is very important. Dreamland's been reported almost mythologically as existing. This is actually a, a, a listed facility. Ground Star MOC and Blackjack Team and then Roulette Team, Aquaspray and Sea Spray. Now, what's interesting about Blackjack Team is that Blackjack Control is at Edwards. This uh, Blackjack Team is at Nellis. And there is an underground connector that goes at enormous velocity that deals with the very advanced anti-gravity type technology that is an underground connector between the high desert of California and this base uh, near Nellis Air Force Base. And the, the, the transportation can be totally underground, subterranean, and undetectable. And we know people, I personally know people who have been in that system. I will also point out that the Los Alamos facility has an underground connector that connects it to the uh, so-called Dulce deep underground facility where there are biological and other experiments going forward where they've been creating the so-called program life forms, the ET, the fake ETs that uh, <laughs> people uh, have seen often as the greys and the reptilians, which are actually man-made creatures, have nothing to do with the actual ETs. So. I wanted this to – I'm just going to go through these quickly because we don't have all day, obviously. But this document is an absolute smoking gun. Now, one of the things I wanted to say about this document that you can all now see up on our website uh, from the National Reconnaissance Office from 1991 is that when I briefed the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff about 13 years ago in 1997, I gave him this document. And he was astonished that I had it. He'd never seen any such thing. Um, he could not find out anything about these programs. Uh, and I, therefore, gave him a packet that is included now in uh, the materials that, as I mentioned, on this two-hour DVD, there is a f almost 500-page packet of briefing materials that include these documents. And that was given to this admiral who was the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And as a consequence, he received that prior to my meeting with him personally. And he uh, looked into this, and he found that through one of these numbered and named compartments, which I, I don't want to go into which one, he was able to locate it under his command and through his command, which, of course, he didn't even know it existed. This is the nature of these unacknowledged black projects. And so when he got hold of them, he said, look, I'm Admiral so-and-so. I want to be read into, which is military talk for briefed. I want to be read into this project. And he was told, Admiral, we know who you are, but you don't have a need to know. And he, of course, was livid. He said, God damn it, if I don't have a need to know, who does? I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they said to him, sir, we cannot discuss this with you further. And they went click and cut the line and blocked his line so he could never reach them again. Now, here's – now, this I learned directly from his office. Now, the problem – with this, then this gets pretty scary. I know when I was briefing some senior government officials uh, in, a, in another country about this, is that they were they were horrified because here you have someone at the most senior level of the most powerful military in the world who himself could not get access to a compartmented project within his command dealing with this subject. The same thing happened to General Patrick Hughes, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and, uh, and to these other officials that I'm referring to. So we know the document is legitimate because it gave what we would call actionable intelligence is the buzzword in, in the intelligence community. It provided actionable intelligence that enabled this admiral, who was head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to actually locate the operation and talk to someone within it. 
but he was basically stiff-armed out of it and said, we're not going to tell you anything. Now, the same thing has happened to the President of the United States at various times. We know it happened to Jimmy Carter. We know it happened to Bill Clinton. Uh, we know it happened to CIA Director Jim Woolsey, who I personally briefed on the matter, and, and other senior officials. Um, for this reason, we have put together this new briefing for President Obama and his senior national security team. And the reason we have is because we feel that now that we have all this evidence and documents and also actionable intelligence, that the president can assign a special assistant for this matter and put them on this and find out what is really going on and get control of it before it's too late. And uh, when I provided this information to Bill Clinton, President Clinton and his CIA, I didn't have these documents. I didn't have a lot of the information. We did not have the 550 top secret uh, men and women who have been inside the corporate world dealing with this issue and inside these classified projects that we have today. So Obama has the benefit of that, which his predecessors did not have. So we have put this together in an, an encyclopedic and comprehensive briefing, including an updated version of what I had provided to Congressman Christopher Cox. And this is another document that's up there. Now, this is not a government document, but it was, it was generated at the request of a government official. As you all know, Congressman Cox, who was head of the Securities and Exchange Commission during the meltdown of the late Bush years, but prior to that had been a, a congressman from Orange County, is a Republican from the Orange County area. Uh, I personally briefed him back in 1996, about 14 years ago. And as a result uh, of that meeting, he asked me to put together who and where these specific projects are located. Where are the facilities? What are the names of them? What are the uh, uh, names of the corporations? And which government labs are specifically tied to uh, extraterrestrial research projects, uh, UFO, so-called propulsion systems, and what have you? Because even though he was a, a quite an important member of Congress and and was on some key committees that should have been briefed on this matter, he had never heard of it. He had never had any access. And as a result of that, I put together and then have updated this, uh, this, this uh, document for President Obama. And in it, I go through some of the background, which I've already shared with you, but have also uh, provided uh, in the uh, sort of uh, enclosure of this letter to Congressman Cox the facilities um, and the specific facilities. For example, Edwards Air Force Base, Haystack Butte, China Lakes Naval Facility, George and Norton Air Force Bases, which were decommissioned, uh, the Tabletop Mountain Observatory that NASA runs, is that it deals with this issue, Blackjack Control. Now, these are the Edwards Air Force Base and related facilities. Now, note in the document, we got Blackjack Team. Now, uh, what's interesting is that I had been given this intelligence on blackjack control and had created this document for Congressman Cox before I ever got this top-secret NRO document that I just shared with all of you. Think about that. That's corroboration. So we know our intelligence was good. The aerospace facilities, there's the Tihon uh, ranch, Ant Hill, Northrop Ant Hill facility. It's called the Ant Hill. McDonald's Douglas, which is now a Boeing. Of course, they merged the Lano plant, where they build the alien reproduction vehicles. The Lockheed Martin Hellendale plant. The Phillips Labs facility at the North Edwards facilities. These are all associated with the Edwards Air Force uh, base and the related range out in the high desert of California. And then there's the Nellis complex, which we've gone over. Uh, and then there are the New Mexico facilities, Los Alamos National Laboratories, Kirkland Air Force Base, and specifically Sandia National Laboratories, SNL, and the Defense Nuclear Agency, Phillips Labs again, Monsanto Weapons Storage Facility, Coyote Mc Canyon Test Site at the north end of the Manzano Range, and the White Sands Complex. 
And then we go through Arizona, Fort Huachuca, where there's an underground storage facility where there are ET spacecraft and ET bodies that are stored there that are the result of our having used Star Wars weapons to shoot them down. The National Security Agency and Army Intelligence Complex near Fort Huachuca, et cetera. So this document goes through all, and this is now also up on our website for you to see. Um, and then there are others that are mentioned. The Dugway Proving Grounds outside Provo, I mentioned, uh, is a state-of-the-art facility, mostly run by the Mormon corporate complex uh, out in Utah. It's near, it's near Provo, but it's out in the desert. Interestingly, it, its airspace is classified and there's no roads that go to this particular area of Dugway. And so you have to be in a classified aircraft with classified airspace clearance to even get to it, literally, unless you go underground. Um, and there's also uh, the Redstone uh, Arsenal Complex in Alabama, the Pine Gap Underground Facility in Australia, um, and the Lawrence Livermore Labs, and the Cheyenne Mountain uh, Deep Space Network, as it's called, that has a dedicated console, Console 52, uh, is what it used to be called, that tracks ET spacecraft as they approach the atmosphere. And then there are various other government agencies I list that are involved, the DARPA, DIA, CIA, NRO, et cetera. And then the private corporations that have been involved in this over the years, BDM Corporation, Bechtel, Booz Allen Hamilton, Boeing, EG&G, E-Systems, Lockheed Martin, uh, McDonnell Douglas, which is now part of Boeing, MITRE Corporation, Northrop, uh, Grumman, uh, Phillips Labs, Raytheon, uh, E-Systems, etc. Rockwell, SAIC, TRW, um, Wackenhut, and others. So these are all ones that are listed, um, and uh, then there are a set of, of suggestions and recommendations for action for the congressman. So this is a very, very important document that gives people sort of an overview, and there are other facilities as well. We're, we learn of new facilities and corporations all the time. So those are some of the things I wanted to, to share uh, you, you get a sense of the sort of uh, – and we're, we're just now through two documents that, that are out of the, the, the hundreds that are in this briefing for the president. Um, historically, though, I think there are some very interesting documents that people often overlook. One that I understand was unintentionally declassified that was um, uh, a top-secret document from Canada. It's known popularly as the Wilbur Smith Memo. Uh, dated uh, November 21st, 1950. 50. Now, this is uh, 60 years ago now, almost. And this particular memo from the Department of Transport that was top secret um, was a, a communication uh, from this scientist uh, who was looking into uh, the ET issue. And uh, they had been asked about it because the uh, uh, some of the people in the government of Canada had heard that we had acquired one of these so-called back then they were called flying saucers, uh, and in this top secret memo, uh, I, I, we, we make note on the on the second page of it, uh, and and this again is in the materials that are now on the website and in the book, but it says uh, a, a, a few very interesting uh, uh, conclusions. A the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the H-bomb. Now, remember, the H-bomb had not been detonated until 1952, and this was written in 1950. What could be of higher classification than the development of the ultimate doomsday weapon, the hydrogen bomb? This subject was more highly contained and classified. B, flying saucers exist, period. It's just a statement. C, their modus operandi is unknown, but a concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. Now, Dr. Vannevar Bush was a man who headed up the Manhattan Project in World War II and later headed up a team of scientists that included Edward Teller and a number of other people to study the ET spacecraft that we have got at the Roswell and other places. Now, this is, an, this is a non-contested document. In other words, there's no, no argument about the legitimacy of this officially released document that slipped through and out of the Canadian classification system. Uh, and then, D, 
the entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance, period. So that's 60 years ago, my friends. What has gone on since? So that's, that just is something that if you read that, the breathtaking nature of these conclusions from this uh, top secret document from Canada from 60 years ago, and imagine what has transpired in the intervening 60 years. So uh, that's what we're talking about. This is the most important story of our lifetimes and really uh, of the history of the human race. Now, another very interesting document, which we acquired, it was in very poor condition, um, was dated the 22nd of March, 1950. And this is a very interesting thing. It's a guy from Guy Hottel, H-O-T-T-E-L, SAC, Strategic Air Command, Washington, to the director of the FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. And... Uh, the subject was uh, flying saucers, information concerning. Uh, there's some blackened out material, but it says the following information was furnished to, and it gave some sources, uh, names that had to be blackened out. An investigator for the Air Force stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were de- uh, described as being circular in shape with raised centers 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. According to Mr. X, it's blackened out, the informant, the saucers were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high-powered radar set up in that area and it is believed that the radar interferes with the controlling mechanism of the saucers. No fuller value, blah, 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 blah. And so now that last paragraph is what's important. We have learned that, as you know, if you go back to the 20s and 30s, and this was written in 1950, that Tesla and others were doing things with scalar electromagnetic coils and things of this sort. And there were a lot of classified work. As you know, the Philadelphia experiment was in 1942. This is 1950. So there were a lot of advanced electromagnetic studies that had already been done. And this isn't known by the general public, but it's true. Interestingly, we have found out that where these ET craft crashed was near, of course, Roswell. Everybody's heard of the Roswell event. What people don't realize is that that was the only nuclear bomb squadron in the world at the time. It was the only nuclear weapons place on the planet. It was before the Soviets got them, and it was a very high security area. The ETs were extremely worried about our ability to destroy all life on Earth with these weapons of mass destruction. And so they became fully materialized, which you don't see that often now, but they became fully materialized in that area, seeing what we were doing with these weapons, because they were very concerned not only for Earth, but for the fact that we were beginning to go into space and what this might mean for the rest of the the, the order of the universe. And when they were in the area, they switched on these what looked like radar dome or radar arrays that were actually scalar electromagnetic weapons. And it affected the electronics of these ET spacecraft because they're not jets or rockets. They run on what we've been talking about for years through the orionproject.org and, and our research, and that is very advanced electromagnetic systems. And what happened is that uh, one of these ET spacecraft hit the other, and they went down. Now, this memo says there were three that were downed eventually. Uh, we know that in this one incident there were two, one that went down northwest of Roswell and the other one went down uh, west of there near Socorro, New Mexico. And, uh, of course, and all the rest is history. Now, what's interesting about this is that recently uh, one of the witnesses to this, a military witness, has come forward uh, on a, a, a deposition from uh, he died, and when he died, he, he, his family had arranged to release his testimony about this Roswell event, and he was a military officer at the time, and this is also up on our website. So what I think people have to understand, however, is that you don't go through millions of 
light years of space or you know thousands of light years of space and travel faster than the speed of light and get to New Mexico and just have an accidental crash and it just happens to be right near our only nuclear base that happens to have this new quote radar system which wasn't radar at all it was used as a electronic weapon system this was an early SDI Star Wars hit and so began in 1947, what is now a 63-year organized attempt using classified money uh, without the approval and oversight of the Congress, the international organizations, the president, of a nasty war that's going on where we have targeted ET craft and shot them down. And this is a very big security concern for anyone who is aware of what that might mean for Earth, that we do not have our wise elders. Uh, you know, it's not as if there's a committee with the Dalai Lama and, uh, before he passed away, Senator Claiborne Pell, who was a very enlightened and wise elder of the Senate, and some of the better minds amongst us who are running this. We have people who are addicted to war and conflict and want to see Earth dragged into an interplanetary war. And this is why CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is training thousands of ambassadors all over the world to make peaceful contact with these ET visitors. Because if we don't do it, who is? Who's going to do it? And that's why and we want to announce there's some very exciting things that have happened along those lines. We have just decided that we are going to do a one-week um, expedition to... Uh, ancient England near Stonehenge, uh, where there have been ET craft and ET beings uh, seen last year. Colin Andrews, who spoke at our uh, conference at Rio Rico, which we will be having again in October of this year. Um, the second through the fourth. Yes, the second through the fourth. Uh, Colin Andrews will be with us in England uh, during this expedition, which will be July 16th to the 23rd. Uh, we will soon have information about this up on our website. It's going to be a very small expedition, limited to 15 or 20 registrants. But we are going to be not only training people to make contact, but we're going to go into the crop circles and go to Silbury Hill and an area around there that we have gotten permission to use this 1,800-acre farm, where it's sort of in the epicenter of where a lot of these activities have happened. And where, as you all know, in 1992, we had a 100-foot diameter extraterrestrial disk materialize in the field with us, fully materialized. We're going back there. First time we've been back there in 10 years. So it's going to be a very, very exciting event. And those of you who want to join us, um, you're welcome to inquire. Uh, we're also going to be doing uh, an event for three nights in uh, Brittany in France. And there is a 2,000-acre ancient estate that dates back to before the founding of the French uh, Republic uh, and whose family founded the French Republic, who are very supportive of what we're doing. And they have opened up this 2,000-acre estate for our exclusive private use for a three-day, three-night training expedition on the continent. And we will be doing this, and that will the, the dates for that or the July 10th, 11th, and 12th of this summer, July 10th, 11th, and 12th. So we are wanting to open this up further to other countries, and so we are going to be going to both England and France. And so go to uh, CSETI.org to find out more information on that. And the details will be forthcoming soon. We're just in the planning stages of this. But I can tell you that it will be historic because – um, there has been an increased level of ET contact with our group, as you all know from the uh, image of this uh, ET uh, that was taken at Joshua Tree. We'll soon be releasing some images of ETs that appeared and were photographed at Boca Grande Island in the Gulf of Mexico uh, about a month ago or less than a month ago. And uh, we know that the, in the last year, there have been fully materialized craft and ETs that have been seen by the police and other uh, people right near where we're going to be doing this contact expedition in England uh, this summer from July 16th to the 23rd. We're going to be actually staying in a wonderful hotel right near Stonehenge. I mean, a stone's throw from Stonehenge. It's going to be amazing. And then at this place in Brittany on this 2,000-acre estate, 
uh, there have been actual hoverings and near landings of ET craft observed by the owners of the estate uh, and the people in the area over the years. So it's a very important contact area. So these are all really exciting developments. Um, in addition to the expedition at the Outer Banks that we're going to be doing April, uh, uh, I think it's um, 11th. It's 11th through 17th. Yeah, so in about a month we'll be doing a, a whole week at the Outer Banks of North Carolina out on, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, uh, you're welcome to come to that. And we're also planning to be in uh, Creston, Colorado, up in the high desert of the San Luis Valley at about 8,000 feet in June. So uh, we're doing something pretty much every month now. Uh, in August, we're going to be at Mount Shasta, California. And then in October, we're going to be uh, doing the uh, big conference with Richard Hoagland, uh, who did all the work with the structures on Mars and the moon, uh, and who used to be a science advisor to Walter Cronkite. Uh, uh, he, he and uh, Dr. Ted Loader and Colin Andrews of Crop Circle fame and myself will be presenting at Rio Rico this year in October. Uh, and uh, we're also going to be doing a three-day, a two- or three-day workshop in Nashville, North Carolina in September, and then, of course, in Joshua Tree in November. So we're going to be very busy, and you're invited to attend uh, you know, one or more of these. And I think it's very important for people to realize that after 60-some years of clandestine, aggressive, Star Wars-type behavior towards these very enlightened interstellar civilizations, that it's time that we form a global network, uh, a council of our own here on Earth, uh, to create universal peace and to uh, contact openly. And the ETs are saying, yes, every time we do these expeditions, there is an increasing uh, shall we say, thinning of the veil, uh, where they're coming further and further into this dimension uh, and the sort of ramping up of this quantum transformation, this huge leap forward that our civilization is about to make, is becoming quite evident. Uh, there, it, there's no coincidence that in the last few months they have begun not only materializing but being able to be fully photographed by members of our team within feet of our group during these close encounters of the fifth kind ambassador missions where we are inviting them to come and interact with us. Um, th this says that the time is very short. And so we think it's in time now to also do these expeditions in other lands, including uh, the old ancient areas of, of England uh, and also in, in France on the continent. And uh, we wish we could be everywhere at once, but we can't. But these are the things we have planned for this year, which is a breathtaking pace as it is for, for me and for our volunteer team. But I hope you will join us at these and because it's going to be quite important. Because remember, in consciousness, as we go into higher states of consciousness and meditate and remote view and interface with these extraterrestrial civilizations and their technological systems that interface with consciousness and thought, what we're doing is actually we're opening a channel. We're opening a pathway into the good future for Earth, where Earth will become one of many planets that are living together peacefully in the cosmos. And someone has to pioneer that effort. Uh, you know, so far Hillary Clinton, our Secretary of State, has not chosen to do this, tragically. Um, and, and, and so far neither has President Obama, and you should write him and, and express to him your support that he do this. Um, we are hearing from this G7 country, you know, the G7 countries are the seven top industrialized economic powers in the world. One of them has been asking us for three years to assist them in forming a contact team to make open contact with these interstellar uh, civilizations. And uh, they've been waiting for the Obama administration to show some indication that they would be friendly to this or supportive of doing this jointly. Um, we are still, of course, waiting to uh, see what President Obama and his national security team decides to do with this issue. And they may take a pass, like many other administrations have, because they're intimidated by taking on this very powerful international group that's keeping it secret. On the other hand, you know, we can hope and pray that we have more courage and more intelligence uh, in this particular president than we did in some of the past ones, but this remains to be seen. I think that he does need to hear from you. I think you all need to go to our website where we have a system where you can contact the president and your members of Congress and say, look, we would like to see action taken on this. Uh, but in the meanwhile, 
<laughs> it's like the old saying I learned from the better ones when I used to live uh, in the Middle East, that trusting God, but take, tie your camel. We need to tie our camel. We need to, we need to empower ourselves to take care of this ourselves. We can hope that maybe the powers that be in the governments of the world uh, turn around on this issue and do something constructive. But I think that uh, we shouldn't be passive waiting for that to happen. I think we need to take the lead. We, the people, need to form our own citizens' diplomacy effort to make open contact within the framework of universal peace. And the framework of that is universal consciousness. Since we're on the World Fusion Network, I just want to say that the foundation of what we're doing at CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, is based on the concept that all intelligent life in the universe, in fact, all that exists in the universe, is this great unbounded mind manifesting as many beings. And this is the heart of compassion and of enlightenment, but also the foundation of universal peace. It's the recognition that if you see an extraterrestrial being, no matter how big or small or how unusual they might look, inside the light of their eyes is this spark of consciousness. And that conscious mind is a singularity. And we are that conscious mind. And we are that being. And so we, we have a, our motto is, one universe, one people, because there's really one people, one sentient life form inhabiting the entire cosmos. And we need to transcend sort of the barriers of, of, of differences of appearance or even what star system we appear, uh, are coming from, because we really are at least 60 years into a period where the world should have known this, but also where our technologies would have allowed us to travel among the stars. No less a figure than Ben Rich, who is the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, said before he died, and we have multiple witnesses for this, that we already had the means to travel among the stars, but that these were locked up in the vault in black projects, and it would take an act of God to get them out to benefit humanity. He went so far as to say, Ben Rich said, that we have the means to take E.T. home all the way back to other star systems. So here we have a situation where uh, while this sounds like science fiction to so many people, it's only because they've been lied to and all this has been kept secret. And uh, what we're wanting to do is change that in the secrecy, bring out these new sciences and technologies, which is what the orionproject.org is doing, and form a, uh open diplomatic team that's making contact with these civilizations. And they are showing us great encouragement in that regard, more than I've ever seen in doing this for 20 years. I formed... C. Seti in 1990, and this is 2010. And uh, in 20 years, I've never seen such demonstrable uh, contact where they're clearly indicating that they're wanting to move this to the next level, which is open contact with our civilization. So we need to prepare for that. And I think that those of us who understand the implications of this matter need to be the uh, vanguard of ambassadors, and so we're inviting all of you to do that if you feel so moved by your own awareness and spirit. So these are a few of the uh, uh, things I wanted to share. There are more documents that are up there, and uh, you can look at them, uh, but I did want to uh, give you this sort of overview of the kinds of materials. Also in this briefing are all the videos and uh, images that we have of ET spacecraft, as well as uh, the testimony of uh, several dozen of these top secret witness witnesses. Uh, so all of this is being given to, to the president and, and to his senior uh, national security team. And uh, we're wanting to, to have some of this now up on our website, and I hope you will visit disclosureproject.org and csetic.org as well. And I just want to add on the disclosureproject.org website, the cover letter that Dr. Greer wrote uh, to President Obama about this briefing document is prominently displayed on that website. You can click on it and read the whole cover letter. It's, it's about six or so pages, and it is the most comprehensive overview of this whole subject, concisely put into six pages that you'll ever find anywhere. It's amazing. So this is where we are, my friends, and I, I'll tell you that next week, uh, the next show that we do in two weeks, we're going to have a, a very big announcement concerning the, the, the forming of the Council on Interplanetary Relations and a global uh, interplanetary peace initiative, and we're going to ask all of you to participate in the formation of this uh, historic uh, Council for Peace on Earth and Peace in the Cosmos. 
Well, I'd like to thank all the folks at the World Puja Network for allowing us this time, and I hope this has been informative and interesting to everyone. And uh, until next time, God bless you all, and thank you, Linda, for helping. And thank we you. will uh, we will talk to you soon. Bye bye.